Throughout most of history, royal weddings had nothing to do with love. Marital alliances were forged and broken based solely on the political needs of the various ruling dynasties. The men and women born in these families were raised to marry whomever their family decided in order to ensure its survival and prosperity. If love ever became a reality between these couples, it was a happy and rare consequence of marriage, not the reason for it. On the contrary, in his treatise, Ulial Consleiro, written around 1438, King Edward of Portugal warned married couples to the dangers of love and passion, advising them instead to pursue marital friendship based on mutual respect and support. Throughout the 16th century, the ruling houses of Iberia, the Habsburgs on the Spanish side and the Avige on the Portuguese one, successively married each other generation after generation. These marriage alliances secured the power and continuation of both dynasties, creating complex ties of familiar and political interdependency. To understand the origins of the marriages between the Avige and the Habsburgs during the Renaissance, it's necessary to go back in time, to the so-called Age of the Reconquest, the moment the seeds of the Iberian Christian kingdoms were planted. In 1500, from the list of 13 consort queens Portugal had until that moment, eight came from Hispanic kingdoms. From the other five, three were Portuguese, one was English, and the other one, the first consort queen of Portugal, from Savoy. In the same period, several Portuguese princesses married in the kingdoms of Leon, Castile, and Aragon. As such, being natural allies, it's not surprising that the Habsburgs and the Avish continue this politic of Iberian marriages. The Habsburg dynasty, a family of German origins, came to power in Iberia in the early 16th century thanks to the marriage between Philip of Habsburg and Joanna, the daughter of the Catholic kings, Isabella and Ferdinand. The first Iberian marriage between the Habsburgs and the Avish was the marriage of Leonor of Austria, daughter of Philip and Joanna, and the King Manuel of Portugal but this was not the first union between these two families. Philip's paternal grandmother was a Portuguese infanta, Leonor, daughter of King Edward of Portugal, who married the Emperor Frederick III in 1451. But she wasn't the only Portuguese ancestors the Habsburgs had. Philip's mother, Mary of Burgundy, was the granddaughter of Isabel of Portugal, Duchess of Burgundy and daughter of King John I of Portugal, the founder of the Avige dynasty. John I of Portugal was a royal bastard. He was the fruit of the relationship between his father, Peter I of Portugal, and a lady called Teresa Lorenzo, of whom we know very little. John came to power under extraordinary circumstances after his half-brother, King Ferdinand of Portugal, died with no male heirs. In 1385, John managed to be acclaimed King of Portugal, despite his illegitimacy and the fact that he was originally destined to a life in the church, as the master of the Order of Avish, a monastic and military Portuguese order. As the father of a new dynasty, he had to fight against the stain of illegitimacy in his family's reputation. As historian Maria Helena de Cruz Coelho points, his strategy was to present his family as united, cultivated and deeply religious, brave on the battlefield, defenders of the Christian faith and the responsible for the adventure of the maritime expansion. With Philip of Lancaster, John had a prestigious wedding, the first step for the international recognition of his reign. The same strategy was applied in his daughter's case. Isabel married the powerful Duke of Burgundy and later, his granddaughter, Leonor, became Holy Roman Empress. This is how, along with its growing empire, a small periphery kingdom like Portugal managed to have a great deal of influence in European politics. In fact, Emperor Maximilian, Leonor's son, always had his Portuguese cousins in great esteem and kept a close contact with them. In 1500, King Manuel of Portugal married Maria of Castile, daughter of the Catholic kings. He had previously been married to Maria's eldest sister, Isabella, who died in childbirth in 1498. After the death of Queen Maria, Manuel married for a third time with Eleanor of Habsburg, a granddaughter of the Catholic kings. With these marriages, it's possible to understand the beginning of the consequences of such unions, as well as the motives behind them. A possible Iberian Union was already drawn in 1498. On that year, Manuel and his first wife, Isabella, traveled to Spain to be acclaimed the heirs to the Spanish crown. After the death of her only brother, Isabella became the heiress of her parents, the Catholic kings. It was of public knowledge that Isabella's brother, Juan, was a sickly boy. 
This could be one of the reasons to Manuel's insistence in marrying Isabella. He knew that if her brother died with no heirs, something that later came to pass, Isabella would become the heiress of Castile and Aragon. Manuel would automatically become king of Spain simply through his wife's inheritance. In 1498, this dream of a unified Iberia almost became real, but Manuel's travel to Spain ended up becoming a nightmare. Isabella, who was pregnant at the time, died in childbirth in Zaragoza. The child, the presumed heir to Portugal, Castile and Aragon, died two years later, and with him, the dream of a unified Iberia under Portuguese command. After his death, Juana the Mad became the heiress of her parents, ushering in the rule of the Habsburgs in Spain. Widower and with no children, Manuel had to seek a new wife. The Catholic kings immediately proposed their third daughter, Maria, as a bride. One of the main reasons for this was the fear felt by the Catholic kings, especially Isabella, of the possibility of Manuel marrying Juana of Trastamara, a rival of Isabella who claimed herself to be the real Queen of Castile and Isabella usurper. Isabella knew that Juana still had a power to rally around her supporters for her cause. The fact that Juana lived in Portugal, under the protection of its king, made her an asset used by the Portuguese in their Iberian politics. This is the reason why the Catholic kings wasted no time offering Maria to Manuel. The same logic was applied 18 years later when Charles V, the new ruler of Spain, still fearing the menace of Juana, offered his sister Eleanor in marriage to Manuel. Besides annulling the danger of Manuel marrying Juana, Charles made the Portuguese king his brother-in-law and ally, in a particularly difficult time for him in Spain, with a rising number of rebellions against Charles. Over the next generation, this marital policy was repeated and taken one step further. The Habsburgs were new in the Iberian Peninsula. Most saw them as northern foreigners, with little understanding of Spanish politics and interests. If the Habsburgs wished to remain and be accepted, they had to find a strategy to strengthen their ties to the peninsula. In cases like this, Marriage is the most efficient answer. Not only would that create stronger bonds with the Spanish crown, it would also ensure a peaceful relationship with their powerful neighbor. The marriage between Charles V and Isabel of Portugal was a desire of her father, Manuel. But when he died in 1521, negotiations were still taking place. It was his son, John III, the new king of Portugal, that continued the talks, starting new ones for his own marriage. Charles offered his youngest sister Catherine, who at this point, lived in captivity with her mother, Juana de Med, in Tordesillas. These marriage negotiations were more important than ever after the dispute over the Moluccas islands erupted between the Portuguese and the Spanish crowns, turning their relationship sour. In September of 1522, a Spanish ship arrived in San Lucar de Barrameda, near Seville, loaded with spices from the Moluccas islands, equally known as Maluku Islands, located in Indonesia. John III immediately protested that the cargo of the ship to be returned to Portugal because, according to the Treaty of Tordesillas, signed in 1494, between the King of Portugal and the Catholic kings, the territory where the Moluccas Islands were located belonged to Portugal. Charles V claimed that the territory belonged to the Spanish crown. It's in this context that the marriages of Catherine of Habsburg and Isabel of Portugal must be comprehended. Catherine and John married in 1525, and Isabel and Charles in the following year. The issue with the Moluccas Islands was only solved in 1529 with the Treaty of Zaragoza, but according to Portuguese historian Ana Isabel Buesco, the biographer of John III and Catherine of Austria, the dispute over the islands was only really extinguished with the Iberian Union of 1581. It's interesting to note that since 1522, the year he signed the Treaty of Windsor with Henry VIII, Charles V was promised in marriage to Henry's daughter, Mary Tudor, between Mary and Isabel, Charles chose Isabel for several reasons. Mary was only a child at this moment, Charles was close to 30. If he married the English princess, he would have to wait several years until an heir could be born. On the other hand, Isabel was only some years younger than Charles, meaning that the marriage could be consummated right away and Isabel had all the conditions to start giving birth to children. Charles also faced the pressure that the Spanish crown was exerting over him, in order for him to marry his Portuguese cousin. In the Court of Toledo of 1525, the moment the marriage between Charles and Isabel was decided, the reasons for the choice of Isabel were justified because, amongst others, Isabel was, quote, a very excellent person and very beautiful, 
plus she, quote, speaks our language. Besides these reasons, it's important not to forget the fact that by marrying an Iberian princess, Charles, born and raised in Flanders, would be better accepted in his new kingdoms. And of course, the astronomical dowry Isabel brought with her sealed the decision. It's curious to know that in both unions, on a personal level, both brides had their wishes come true. Catherine found in her marriage a way of escaping life with her mother in Tordesillas, and Isabel fulfilled her aspirations of becoming Holy Roman Empress. The marriage between Catherine and John was a happy one, all historians are unanimous about that. The couple respected and trusted one another, John never had any known lovers and illegitimate children out of his marriage, and Catherine was his trusted advisor, having a seat in the state council. If it's not possible, due to the lack of documentation, to talk about love in Catherine and John's case, the same is not true in the case of Charles and Isabel, where it's clear that they had feelings toward each other beyond just marital companionship. When Charles met Isabel for the first time on March 10 of 1526 in Seville, he was so pleased with what he saw that he decided to marry her the same night. It's recorded that the new couple spent most of their time together. Their first months of marriage was spent in Granada, in the opulent Alhambra Palace, amongst fountains and gardens. These were probably the happiest days of their lives. Soon, on both sides of the frontier, the two new royal couples started producing offspring. In her biography of John III, Anne Isabel Buishk called the children of Catherine and John dismal stars, children as ephemeral as shooting stars. Besides being first cousins, Catherine and John, as well as Charles and Isabel, had many ancestors in common. As a result of continuous endogamic unions, members of the nobility and royalty saw that practice reflected on their health. The results were higher levels of child mortality, bigger risks of miscarriages, physical and mental health problems, as well as lower fertility rate. John and Catherine saw most of their offspring died in their first years. They had a total of nine children, but only two survived past infancy, Maria Manuela and John Manuel, only to die before they turned 18 years old. The lack of heirs was a serious issue for any dynasty, as it could mean its extinction and unexpected political shifts. According to American art historian Anne Mary Jordan, who has dedicated her career to the study of Habsburg women, Catherine lost her capacity of bearing children in an early age, which in the case of a queen, was a dramatic situation. Jordan points to the presence in Catherine's collections of a tusk of a narwhal, thought to be the horn of a unicorn, believed to have therapeutical capacities in female fertility. On the other side of the border, Charles and Isabel saw only three of their children survive, Philip, Maria and Joanna. The others died in childhood or were the result of miscarriages. Isabel, who had a fragile health, died of the consequences of her last pregnancy at 35 years of age. But politics spoke louder, and soon the new generation reached marrying age. Once again, Avis and Habsburgs were united by marriage, another double marriage between cousins. The first union was the one of Philip, heir to the Spanish crown, and Maria Manuela, the only living daughter of the kings of Portugal, in 1543. According to Anne Mary Jordan, Catherine of Austria paid a close attention to her daughter's education, spending great sums on books and carefully choosing her teachers. Besides an intellectual education, Catherine also made sure her daughter had all the skills a princess would need, like the knowledge of court etiquette, religion and domestic management. Jordan points to the fact that the great responsible for Maria's marriage with a Spanish prince was Catherine, who fervently wished to see her daughter Queen of Spain. When Maria moved to Spain after spectacular festivities in Lisbon, her parents were visibly sad for her departure, as they truly liked their daughter. On her side, Maria faced some difficulties in fitting in her new home and with her new husband. Nonetheless, soon after her arrival, Maria, now titled the Princess of the Asturias, became pregnant. Nine months later, John and Catherine were devastated after receiving the news that their beloved daughter died days after she gave birth to a baby boy. Charles, like his grandfather. Charles, the result of generations of inbreeding, suffered with physical and possibly mental health issues all his life, dying at an early age in mysterious circumstances. The last great royal wedding between the Habsburgs and the Avis was celebrated in 1552 between John, heir to the Portuguese throne, and Joana, the youngest daughter of the emperors. 
This marriage was fundamental for the future of the Portuguese monarchy, as the only living heir, John, was a sickly boy, and his parents couldn't have any more children. The future of the Avige dynasty was hanging by a thread, and the kings of Portugal were counting with Joana's fertility to ensure its survival. The story of this couple is a sad one. After her arrival in Portugal in December of 1552, Joana quickly became pregnant. The new couple enjoyed each other's company, and the kings of Portugal were pleased with their niece turned daughter-in-law, but things took an unexpected turn. Three weeks before the delivery of his child, John Manuel, who never had a strong health, died unexpectedly, possibly from juvenile diabetes. His parents were devastated for his loss. The only hope for the continuation of the lineage of John III and Catherine of Austria was now concentrated on their unborn grandchild. In order to protect Joana from the news of the death of her husband, something that could lead to a miscarriage, something the kings of Portugal were trying to avoid at all costs, John III and Catherine, probably making the ultimate sacrifice, kept the death of their son a secret to Joana, forbidding public manifestations of mourning, and changing their black clothes when in the presence of their daughter-in-law. On the 20th of January of 1554, Joana gave birth to a boy, baptized Sebastian, the new heir to the Portuguese throne. On the same day, Joana was informed of the death of her husband, confirming the suspicions she already had. Sometime later, Joana was summoned to Castile in order to become its regent due to the absence of her father, Charles V, and the eminent departure of Philip to England to marry Mary Tudor. Joana never remarried and presented herself until her death as the widow princess of Portugal, always dressed in mourning. She also never saw her son again, only keeping close contact with Sebastian through letters and the exchange of portraits. Joana died in 1573 in the royal monastery of Lar de Calças in Madrid, where she spent the rest of her life. The last real marriage between the Avige and the Habsburgs was the marriage of Maria of Portugal and Alexander Farnes in 1565. Maria was the daughter of Prince Edward, John III's brother, and Isabel of Braganza, making her the niece of the kings of Portugal. The husband was a member of the Italian house of Farnes. It might seem that this union had no direct connection to the ruling houses of Iberia, but in fact, it did. Maria was undoubtedly a member of the house of Avish. As a member of the royal family, her marriage was a state affair, only to be used for the benefit of the kingdom. Once again, the choice went to the house of Habsburg, or, in this case, a house that was under the direct influence of the Habsburgs, the Farnes family. This was because Alexander's mother, Margaret of Parma, was an illegitimate daughter of Charles V, born from an affair the emperor had before his marriage with Isabel of Portugal. As such, the Farnes family were affiliated to the Habsburgs, making Alexander a suitable husband for the Portuguese princess, renewing the bonds between the ruling houses of Iberia. But this close proximity, sometimes bordering on incest, was a dangerous strategy. As Portuguese historian Isabel dos Guimarães Sá put it, these were Russian roulette marriages. The first house to run out of heirs would be cannibalized by the other. These turned out to have disastrous consequences for Portugal in the last decades of the 16th century. Sebastian, the precious grandson of the kings of Portugal, became its king when he was just a child, ushering in a period of regency by his grandmother, Catherine of Austria. It's fair to say that this regency was the responsible for the downfall of Catherine in the eyes of the Portuguese historians for a very long time. Until recently, Catherine was seen in the worst of lights, as an agent of Spanish interests, actively working for the Iberian Union under Habsburg command, something that is obviously not true. The fact that her regency didn't end it in the best terms also contributed to this misconception. Her grandson Sebastian is one of the great mysteries of Portuguese history. His name is normally accompanied with all types of legends and theories, some crazier than other. One of the most controversial aspects about Sebastian's life was his body, both physical and mental. It's important not to forget that he, like his Spanish cousin Charles, was a product of generations of inbreeding between first cousins. In fact, although technically they were cousins, in terms of their blood, Sebastian and Charles were more like brothers. Rumors of a deformed body extra toes, and one side of his body bigger than the other swirled around Sebastian, as well as madness or an unbalanced personality. Unfortunately, it's not possible to know for sure if these rumors were true or were just that, rumors,
because his body is missing. Ignoring everybody's counsel, including his uncle Philip II of Spain, guided by politics but also his fervorous religious upbringing and influenced by chivalric culture, Sebastian embarked on what was baptized as the Journey of Africa. On August 4 of 1578, Sebastian led the Portuguese army in the Battle of Alcázar Quivir, in modern-day Morocco. The outcome of this battle was a complete and utter disaster for Portugal. The Portuguese army was crushed, most of the top members of the Portuguese nobility either died or were captured, and Sebastian vanished. The last time he was seen, he was on his horse, charging at full speed against the enemies. He was never seen again, and his body was never recovered. This was a heavy defeat, arguably the biggest in Portuguese history. Not only did the king disappear, most of the aristocratic families of the kingdom were now in mourning or trying to pay the war ransoms demanded for the freedom of their relatives. More than anything, Alcácer Quibir was a psychological defeat. With the death of a childless Sebastian, his great-uncle Henry became king, but this was only a temporary solution. Henry was old and a cardinal. After two years of reign, Harry died leaving the Portuguese Empire in chaos. Many claimed the right to the Portuguese crown, including an unexpected and completely baseless application by Catherine of Medici. But the bonds between the Habsburgs and the Avige made Philip II of Spain the one in the best position to assume the Portuguese throne, something he did in 1581. For a period of 60 years, Portugal was part of the Spanish crown, giving Philip and his descendants an empire where truly the sun never set it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.